There is perhaps no distilled drink more firmly associated with one nation than gin is with the English. It's ironic then that the English did not invent gin. It is thoroughly a Dutch drink um, of what is today the Netherlands and Flanders and Belgium. And even the word gin, as you might not know, is a corruption of a Dutch word, which is Jennifer. Um, Dutch gin is usually made from grains such as barley, wheat, rye, and what is today called oud Jennifer or uh, old gin, can even be aged in wood. So it comes actually strangely closer to whiskey than you might think. Um, so it's brown, slightly sweet, and in most respects, most examples of this do resemble whiskey. The only crucial difference being one plant that makes gin unique is juniper. That's the flavor. Um, it can include lots of other flavors, of course, too, and really great gin does include many of them, but it's uh, but juniper berries are what make it distinct. Young gin, or young Jennifer, I should say, can be made with uh, sh made of sugar. It can be made of anything, actually. Um, it's lighter in color, much lighter in flavor, and the name um, again really has nothing to do with the. Um, you know, with the age, actually, it actually actually has to do with the style. Uh, the old one is the old-fashioned version. The new one is the the, the newfangled one, which is lighter and cleaner. Um, now, for most most folk stories, for reasons that completely elude me, give you an origin of gin to the 17th century. They say that it was invented by a person who's actually one of my authors. It's the Yatro chemist, a uh, medical doctor who was working in chemistry named Silvius de la Boa, who was a professor from Leiden. Um, they usually claim that he is the inventor of gin. Um, I don't know why no one seems to have looked at older recipes that for alcohol, medical recipes, because there are things that look very, very much like gin. Um, they're heavy on juniper, they have other botanicals added, sometimes some spices, as of course most gin does, and moreover, what Silvius was working with was juniper essential oil. It's not actually gin. Um, and in fact, the Dutch state instituted a tax on waters, which means, of course, eau de vie, made from juniper, fennel, and anise in the year 1606, which is before Silvius was born. <laughs> so clearly, the guy did not invent gin, okay? And I thought it might be interesting for me to um, look at some older texts and, and kind of figure out for... for um, where gin comes from and, um, and maybe speculate why no one has actually looked closely at this stuff and seen that it's actually really gin. So I looked at 1552 in Kostelig Distiller book, which is, means a, a worthy distilling book, in How den de rechte ende waterich konste de distillieten om al de hande water in de kruiden, which means make waters out of vegetables. It's by Philippus Hermani, who was a physician in Antwerp, um, I think has the first written recipe, and, and I would speculate there are probably many older uh, medieval ones, almost certainly derives from those, such as the 15th century one written by a doctor named Hubertus, which is Sequentur Proprietates et Virtutes Granorum Juniperi. It's a book on the, the properties of uh, juniper berries. And he was a, a physician in Sertogenbos, which is a town in the Netherlands. And Hermani's, it's a little different. It's made from wine, so it's a proper eau de vie, as we've seen before. But he says if you put the juniper berries in this, distill it with it, it's good for digestive problems, plagues, cold, bites of venomous animals. Um, and I guess this probably is going to taste a lot like what we think of as gin today. In the ensuing years also, remember, what has happened in Europe is not only this boom in alcohol trade and dis distillation, but Europe goes under, undergoes a little ice age. So remember the vineyards that formerly grew fairly north in Europe, um, and remember in England as well, are uh, frozen and they die. In fact, between 1511 and 1524, the, um, and by the, there's a, a cold spell, let's say, and by the middle of the century, uh, the northern boundaries of grape production are severely limited. So manufacturers say, oh, well, if this grain is, is if the grape is hard to get hung by, let's just use grain and distill that. Easy enough. Um, and it's right about this time that the word Jennifer, um, that's G-E-N-E-V-E-R. 
okay? And I'm, I've never quite understood why in Dutch the G is usually a H sound, um, uh, but in the word Jennifer it's a, it's a J. So it's usually around this time that Jennifer is distinguished from Brandtewine, which is of course where we get the word brandy also, a Dutch thing. Um, but, and those are becoming much less frequently medicinal and much more often a, uh, a recreational drink. People actually just want them for fun. So it's, it's right about this time that Hermani complains about people drinking spirits that are distilled from a kind of beer. Okay, he makes so, so clearly this is, I think that's a good indication that this is going recreational. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that it was only the Dutch making drinks like gin. In fact, maybe it's even wrong to claim the Dutch invented it. If we look, for example, at a uh, book by the Neapolitan, it's from Naples, um, Johannes Baptista della Porta, really interesting figure. He was a magician, more or less. And by that I mean like doing occult magic and doing uh, magic tricks, literally. Uh, but anyway, he wrote a book called um, De Distillatione, on distillation, in 1604. And it includes an elixir that he says is made from a various simples, and that just means herbs that are unmixed. And it includes sage, oregano, hyssop, satyria, pimpernel, absinthe, um, rosemary, parsley, lavender. So these are all things that actually can go into gin nowadays, but it's got juniper berries. And that's, that's I think, the key that makes this thing. Uh, they're macerated in the liquid and then distilled again, so you don't get any coloration. It's just a clear liquid that's going to have that kind of bracing dryness of gin. Remember when you talk about a martini, you call it dry? Remember that refers to its humoral qualities? Well, here's it literally is what, what it does. Um, and I think there are, there are other versions of this that um, De La Porta has that are, um, you know, look kind of like let's say an ancestor of gin, or a very close ancestor. It's, he's intending it to be medicine, but, but clearly people are drinking it for pleasure by that point. Um, also in The Englishman, 1609, you Platt's Delights for Ladies. It has a recipe for spirits of spices, and it includes uh, cloves, mace, nutmeg, rosemary, but also juniper. So it's gonna give, it, give that, that, that astringent kind of dryness. Um, by the time we get to um, later in the century, John French's Art of Distillation, it has an aqua celestis, which means a celestial water. Isn't that a wonderful word? It's made with 55 separate species of herbs and spices. Juniper's in there too. So, so I think in the early herbal spirits category, the tendency is that you put more in the better. And of course, there, there are gins that follow this, follow suit today. But in, um, I think what maybe would be the, um, reason that people were, were hesitant to call these gins is juniper doesn't play the starring role in these. It's obviously among lots of other things. Um, and these are made mostly by dilettantes at home. They're made on a small scale. They're meant actually for your household consumption. You know, for you invite your friends over, you might have it for pleasure, but it's medicine primarily is why, the, why these distilling books are made. So I think you could say just based on the reason people are distilling these, that it dis should be distinguished from the gin that's sold commercially and uh, and consumed for pleasure. So when we get to that kind of gin, the uh, large scale production, the business model, the export trade, then it is definitely the Dutch who, who begin this. And they do produce it on a large scale and it has nothing to do with medicine. Um, and there are a couple of, couple of very interesting historical reasons for this. So let me just go into them briefly. One is that they're, the Dutch, uh, for reasons that really have just to do with marriages and birth and things, were, became part of the Spanish Empire um, in the uh, 15th and 16th century. Meaning that, well, let me tell you, it's Charles V. He, his grandparents came from Burgundy, which ruled the Netherlands at the time, from Austria, which is why the Habsburg inheritance comes in, and from Spain, his uh, Ferdinand and Isabella were another set of grandparents. And he inherits this big conglomeration that takes over much of Europe, um, including the empire. He buys the uh, title of Holy Roman Emperor. So, sp so the Netherlands comes under Spanish rule. I know that seems kind of weird and arbitrary because the Netherlands is actually much richer. Um, and the um, Dutch fought a war of independence to break away from Spain, very much like the American War of Independence, I should say. It's about a foreign power uh, imposing taxes, you know, having foreign governors be put in, things like that. And most importantly, this was also a war of religion. So the Dutch 
um, broke away from the Catholic Church by and large and were Calvinists, okay, followers of John Calvin. The Dutch Reformed Church is Calvinist, like the Swiss. So, um, so they declared, so this long war took place during with which the northern part of the Netherlands, what becomes the Republic of the Netherlands, separates from the south, which was is modern day Belgium, and that continues to be ruled by Spain, at least for another century. Eventually it's ruled by Austria and other hands. So, but the point is that in the course of the war, this war of independence to break away from Spain, in 1576, the major financial hub for all of Europe, the city of Antwerp, was sacked uh, by the Spanish troops that hadn't been paid. And so they just looted, ransacked, rape and pillage, everything. So the upshot of this whole thing is Antwerp was kind of ruined as a financial center and the finance and trade moves to Amsterdam. Amsterdam was a really sort of second-rate backwater city, literally backwater. I mean, you know, it's it's, um, it's sea level basically. And the um, what happened in the course of this split between the southern and northern Netherlands, Calvinist and Catholic, 1601, the Archduke Albert of the Spanish Netherlands, this is in the south, issued a ban on the manufacture of distilled spirits of grain. He thought it was a corrupter of morals, and his idea is that grain should only be used to make bread, which is nourishing, and if you distill it into spirits, people get drunk and they, um, and it's not nourishing, and it's not good for them, and it's a waste, and it, and it drives up the price of bread so poor people can't eat. So this, this very, it's a well-meaning policy. That's what I want to say. You know, it's not, it's not that he was, um, you know, particularly anti-alcohol in some rabid way. It was just he realized it was doing people harm. So what happens, so all the distillers in the South naturally move up north. They bring with them their expertise, they move en masse, and the law remained in effect through the 17th century. So if you wanted net alcohol, want to produce alcohol, you go to the northern Netherlands. It's not being done in the south. So let me just also give you an idea about the northern Netherlands, the Dutch Republic, as it's often called. Okay, Because so when we speak of the Dutch, that's what we're talking about now, is the north. So in the 17th century, the Netherlands became the wealthiest place on earth, okay? Mostly because they were carrying goods for other nations, um, but also in that they built their own maritime empire. They stole Indonesia away from the Portuguese, including the Spice Islands. Remember, that's very, very lucrative trade. Um, but also they took um, New Amsterdam, right? Which is, you know, the future New York. Islands in the Caribbean like Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, they took Cape Town, South Africa. So they're building this sort of network of places that they can drop off, um, that they can trade goods, pick up raw materials, stop off their ships, and um, of course pick up supplies and things. And for a while they even had Brazil, although the um, permanent colony there will be Suriname in South America. They also, b unbelievably, when the Japanese were kicked out of Japan for trying to convert everyone to Catholicism, remember the Jesuits were the first to go into Japan, um, the Japanese made a concession to the Dutch to stay in um, Deshima, which is uh, an island off of Nagasaki, and trade there. And um, they were the only people allowed to trade with Japan from the early 17th century all the way into 1850s. So, so it's it's a, they basically cornered the market or monopolized trade with Japan. Now, what is um, strange is that because they were Calvinists, remember that very stern religion, which was, of course, also Massachusetts Bay Colony, were Calvinists also, um, Puritans, let's see if you want to use that word, same, same, same idea. They didn't spend a whole lot on lavish clothes. They didn't spend on consumable goods. In fact, it was seen as kind of kind of distasteful to squander your wealth on big palaces and things. So their tastes remained very simple. And most of the money that they spent was used to reinvest into businesses like um, including industries like manufacture of Jennifer and brewing of beer, things like that, which I spoke about a few lectures back. And this is an insight I had never really sort of grasped until I was in Amsterdam speaking at a conference a handful of years ago. And, you know, in Amsterdam you can not only go into a, uh, a coffee shop and buy uh, marijuana and smoke it, 
uh, in public, but but they're prostitutes. You know, you can wander down the street and there are windows and you can see them and everything. It's a very strange place. And you think, oh my God, this place must be extraordinarily liberal. And, and in many ways it is. But the insight I had was meeting with many um, Dutch people when I was there. And the funny thing is they don't do those things. <laughs> they sell them to tourists. And they, you know, they're happy to let Americans, you know, smoke marijuana and wander down the streets in a stupor um, or use prostitutes. But they, the Dutch themselves don't really use it that much. So they, and I think what this insight is, is in the 17th century, it's exactly the same. They're happy to sell gin to other people, um, but they're not really drunken in the way that, you know, you might imagine as being such purveyors of alcohol. They're not. They're, they're actually very sober and simple people. And this goes for the, the cuisine also. It's very, very simple. All those spices that are coming out of the Netherlands, uh, out of the uh, um, Indonesia, they don't really use them much in their cooking. It's actually pretty simple. So. And I should also mention that the grain for these enterprises, the beer brewing and the, um, and the gin making, is actually not grown in the Netherlands. Because remember, the Netherlands doesn't have a whole lot of farmland. It's actually pretty flat and wet and not very good for grain and pretty cold. Um, you know, when it rains in the Netherlands, a puddle will sit someplace. It'll stay there all year. It doesn't dry. Um, but it's, um, it really, it's a fine place for for cows, you know, on grass and to make cheese, of course, chauda and edam and things like that. And it's a good place for, for a sort of very intense farming of vegetables, which they do, of course. They make the orange carrots, they make Brussels sprouts, you know, things like that. But for grain, which takes a lot of open space and flatness, um, they just don't have that. So what they do is they turn to the Baltic area. This is east of the Elba River, so we're talking about what is now Poland, um, uh, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, what was then um, the Kingdom of Prussia, Brandenburg, um, that whole area. And the reason they go there is that there's still serfdom there. Isn't that weird? Is that the, the people are still tied to the soil and work for very little and have to provide labor for their landlords. And um, so it means the price of grain is really, really cheap there. And there's tons of land, it's flat, the labor's cheap. So the Dutch start picking up grain in what's today Poland. And they, to do this, they invent a boat, which is called a flout, F-L-U-Y-T, big flat sort of barge-like boat that you can just load gr tons of grain into and bring it um, back to the Netherlands where it's distilled and then ship out the other, the, the refined goods, right? The, the beer and the gin and stuff. So, so the Baltic is really, really fascinating to this whole trade. Um, it is crucial. Remember what used to be the Hanseatic towns that were controlled by the Germans? The Dutch take over all of that. And um, what is fascinating to me is if you look at places from stretching from um, Danzig, which is modern-day Gdansk in Poland, up to Reval, which was uh, is now Tallinn in Estonia, all the way to St. Petersburg, the Dutch influence is throughout, and this includes Scandinavia. Um, uh, Helsinki, Stockholm, all have buildings that are influenced by the Dutch in a way, and, and so in fact were the, the Russians. So, so we, don't, we tend to think of the Dutch as a global empire, but really the, the Baltic trade is the mother of all trades, and this is what they, they themselves called it. Um, in any case, the key is that this grain comes from the Eastern Baltic and it's shipped over to the, uh, to the Netherlands. And the other thing is that the, they also get some raw materials on the other side. They get timber for the masts and the ships. They get pitch, which is what you line the outside of the ship with, so it's waterproof and stuff like that. So, um, and iron too, I should mention. So another very interesting boon is that the leftovers from the distilling process the spent grains and yeast, what is called draff, okay, D-R-A-F-F. -F. You feed that to cattle and to pigs, which are, are raised in, in the Netherlands. Um, and that, so that becomes eventually meat and cheese, which are those kind of intense agricultural products that they can do very well in the Netherlands. Um, the other key, and I could, would say this is a key to much of history, is that the animals then in turn produce manure, which goes back into the soil, produces this, you know, so this very high density fruit, fruits and vegetables and things, which are then sold to the cities, which are very populous, very urban center. Um, so everything seems really beautifully connected. And if you think of it in a weird way, the calories that are raised in Poland 
are eventually put into the soil in the Netherlands and it keeps getting richer and richer and more fertile, which is really kind of, kind of a great idea. And the people there are not consuming a lot, so it's all getting shipped out and according to that mercantile theory, the money is coming back in from, from trade. So they get ridiculously wealthy. Now to give you a sense of the scale of this industry, this is called a four cask operation, which means that every four hours there are four casks of mash being made, four casks fermenting, and four being distilled. So, so that's the, the volume at all given times is four casks. A cask includes 13 barrels, so that's 715 gallons per cask times four, so that's four times this, um, is 3,000 gallons a day being distilled. That's a whole lot, okay? That's to make a gallon is, um, you know, it's it's the first really industrial scale distilling. That's there's no nothing even comes close to this. Um, and typical of these distillers is one that is still in operation today, believe it or not, the Bowles Distillery, uh, B O L S, led by Lucas Bowles, who escaped uh, religious persecution, ended up in Cologne first, and then moves up to uh, Amsterdam. By 1664, on record is he had a license to make Jennifer, um, and it's sold in these stoneware bottles that looks pretty much like it would have in the 17th century. So if you ever find, uh, go into any store you, under the section of good gin, you can find bowls. Um, bowls supplied the East, the Dutch East India Company with gin, and they supplied him with exotic spices. So, so it's a, it's not just you know huge industrial scale of production, but it's global trade also. Um, not just through the Atlantic, but we're talking all the way around the other side of the world. So distillation um, does eventually resume in the southern part of the Netherlands. This is once, uh, um, well, there's a war. Um, the, the, well, let me explain it this way. The Spanish keep marrying their first cousins for about a couple of centuries, actually. The last in the line of kings is completely malformed, degenerate, and crazy, okay? So, um, and he dies without any heirs, and there's a war fought over who's going to be king of Spain. The Austrians and the French each have an equal claim, and what happens, this is called the War of Spanish Succession in the early 18th century, is that the rest of Europe really doesn't want France to annex Spain, basically, but they also don't want Austria, because then they're going to have a globe, you know, Europe-wide empire like Charles V had in the past. So what they do is they say an heir of Louis XIV can be king of Spain, and in fact, this king of Spain still is today, believe it or not, he's, he's a Bourbon, he's French in ancestry, but the um, other continental possessions of Spain would go to Austria. So the Belgium goes to Austria, Sicily, um, uh, much of Italy goes to them. So, so in any case, it's the empire split up. So, and Spain becomes a really second-rate power. But the point is that after this war, the southern Netherlands has a kind of boom under Austrian rule. They, um, they uh, actually make distilling legal again in the 18th century. But actually, the, um, many of the Dutch, even formerly southern Netherlands distillers, in that preceding, in the succeeding century, they'd gotten used to being Dutch people, but they'd actually moved elsewhere also. A lot of them had gone to Germany. Many ended up in England. Many ended up, in, strangely enough, in La Rochelle or Cognac, which is in France, to teach them how to distill, uh, making, of course, what brandwein or brandy, which would be made in the southwest of France. A lot of them went to Barbados to distill rum, strangely enough. So it was, and in fact, it was, the, it was Flemings who opened up the very first distillery in the United States. You probably wouldn't guess where this was. It's 1644, a Dutch settlement in an island that really should be part of New Jersey, but it's, it's owned by, it's part of New York City. It's Staten Island. That's where, where the first distillery opens. And these were, were um, Flemish people who'd gone to the Northern Netherlands and eventually ended up in, uh, in what's now New York. So my point is that the Dutch kind of taught most everyone how to distill on a large scale. Uh, Philip Massinger, a playwright, um, well, near contemporary of, of Shakespeare, um, wrote a play called The Duke of Milan, 1623. He, he gives us the very first English use of the term, Geneva, which is um, not the city in Switzerland. It, it's a corruption of the word Jennifer, 
which I should mention also, the name Jennifer also comes from, from the word Juniper and, and Gin, um, Ginevra in Italian, right? Um, so in any case, the, uh, supposedly the English first learned about gin and how to drink it while they were fighting with the Dutch in their war against Spain. Remember, the English were also Protestants. They helped them out. And apparently, before you go into battle, you have a dram. Dram is a little cup about that big. You take a sip, take, take a shot, I guess. And it's the origin of the phrase Dutch courage. You have to have a drink before you go into battle. Sounds like a really bad idea to me, but in any case, it gives you courage. The other sources will say the word gin is first used in Bernard Mandeville's Fable of the Bees, which is a century later, 1714, where he writes this, and this is the word gin, G-I-N, as we use it. Um, Nothing, he says, is more destructive either in regard to health or vigilance and industry of the poor than the infamous liquor, the name of which derives from juniper berries in Dutch, is now by frequent use and by the laconic spirit of the nation from a word middling length shrink into a monosyllable intoxicating gin that charms the unactive, the desperate, and crazy of either sex. <laughs> it is a fiery lake that sets the brain in flame, burns up the entrails and scorches every part within, and at the same time, a lethe of oblivion, meaning it's the river um, that makes you forget everything, in which the wretched immersed drowns his most pinching cares. So clearly, something had changed by the time Bernard Mandeville was writing. Um, not only the word and the spirit from a barrel-aged, herbly spirit to something that is now clear and completely dry, and it's the attitude of people and the effect on the populace um, had also changed. And obviously, given his description, it's not an elite drink anymore, not as it was in the late 17th century. It is now something being sold to the poor. And this is the problem you have when something is distilled on such a scale, becomes so cheap that it's actually cheaper than beer, cheaper than most other, any other drink you can buy, in fact. Um, so to be blunt, let's put it this way, there is what is called a gin craze in early 18th century England, London especially. Henry Fielding. Um, gives us this description. A new kind of drunkenness, unknown to our ancestors, is lately sprung up among us, which, if not put a stop to, will infallibly destroy a great part of our people. Now here's the paradox. How did this happen? How did a drink that ultimately comes to be a byword for urbane sophistication and quasi-medicinal and good for you, come to be the most prevalent form of cheap booze in the new century that replaces the good and, you could say, nutritious beer of good old Merry England. How does that happen? How do they go from a nation of beer drinkers, which is beer being virtuous and good for you, and to gin drinkers, which is, um, debilitating and cheap and you can buy a pint of beer you can get really really snonkered so so first of all it's important to be clear that English gin is a clear spirit that can be made of anything at all um, it's distilled with juniper and a couple of other botanicals it's not a huge range but gin the juniper plays the the uh, leading role and to start with this would have been consumed straight there's no such thing really as a cocktail yet um, that's the modern, sophisticated answer of what you do with alcohol that's really unpalatable on its own. Here they're just drinking it as is. So in 18th century London, I want you to think of people with starched wigs and tricorn hats and, you know, the whole, whole uh, image we have of the 18th century, and drinking a mug of gin, <laughs> okay? So, and that's the way it's consumed. <clears throat> the reason it catches on, of course, is because it's cheap as hell. Um, there's a... Uh, a sign above one gin shop that says drunk for a penny, dead drunk for two, clean straw for nothing. Now what the hell does that mean? Clean straw. Means that once after you're dead drunk you need to sleep there, you're passed out, there's nowhere to go. So if you drink two for two pennies, you can spend the night and uh, sleep in the barn on the straw. Uh, now what is two pennies in 18th century money? I don't know. We have about 200 percent inflation so it's two bucks, I don't know, 20 bucks, let's say. You can you can get dead drunk and spend the night. 
<laughs> that, that sounds about right. So, and I think many people saw the, the um, um, you know, and given, uh, sorry, gin was was cheaper than beer. So if you wanted to get drunk quickly, that's that's what you used. So, and I think, but I think many people saw the rich importing this good Dutch Jennifer, which you can drink straight, supposed to be straight, and wanted to emulate them. So local producers said, well, why, why are we buying this from the Dutch? We can make this ourselves and, um, and sell it much cheaper without having to import it and pay the Dutch. So Daniel Defoe, uh, said in a brief case of the distillers, this is 1726, it seems to me that the poor have done even what their superiors seem to lead them into just now by general example. So he is making it clear that this was a fashion that started among the rich and trickled down by degrees until finally a very cheap product was made available to the poor. They couldn't afford the really expensive stuff. So, so this kind of supports my theory of social emulation, of um, you know, rising social mobility, people wanting to rise up in class, not just having more money, but actually imitating their superiors. And eventually that fashion trickles all the way, all the way down to the bottom when it's not so much a matter of getting out of your class, but of, of just drinking something that's new and cheap and whatever, okay? But, but, the, but the original stimulus, the impetus from the start is the imitation. So I think what, where this, this um, fashion first starts is, and this is another long story I won't go into historically, but the throne of England in 1688 was about to um, go to a Catholic, okay, James II, um, and the English didn't want that to happen, so they actually invited the ruler of the Netherlands, William of Orange, to come and be their ruler because he was Protestant and he was married to the daughter of the previous king. Uh, so this is Mary. You've heard of William and Mary, right? The college in Virginia. This is named for these two. But he was Dutch, okay? And I think that has to do with this association of gin as a Protestant drink as opposed to brandy, which came from France, which was Catholic and suspect in the mind of Englishmen. Um, and uh, this is when, and so this whole event is when James II fled and it's called the Glorious Revolution. It was a real revolution, though no one died in it. Not, I don't think even think a shot was fired. So, so there may have been religious, political, or cultural reasons why things Dutch became popular to start with. In fact, you can see it in the architecture of this period. You can see it in the clothes um, change. But it's also when the English said, let's make a cheap knockoff of the good Dutch gin. We can make this too. And, um, and of course, added to this was England got into various wars with France. So they didn't want to buy brandy anymore or, or, or even uh, wine. The sale was banned. Um, that's why the English, uh, in many, many cases, go to uh, Portugal and drink port or Spain and drink sherry or Dutch gin, but they don't drink French things for, for, for during these wars. Very English, uh, very uh, interesting, I think. So the, when the grain, English grain, good English grain, was now going to production of gin, the government was concerned that this is going to cause the prices in grain to slump because there had been a ton of grain on the market, a glut, and of course when you have a lot of stuff, um, the price tends to go down because people can shop around and buy whatever the, the best price is. So the government decided, let us encourage a way to keep the prices high. So they think it's actually a good idea to have distillation, uh, to use up that excess grain so that the stuff that goes into the market for bread and for basic foodstuffs is kept high because the supply is down. Do you understand this basic, basic logic of mercantile economies? So they passed a... Um, an act. It's called the Act for Encouraging the Distillation of Brandy and Spirits from Corn. And when you see that word corn, incidentally, in a, um, in a British document, it does not mean maize or corn. It means grain in general. Okay? That's, that's true of Brit British English entirely. So the word, we just use corn for whatever reason. Uh, turkey corn is what, the original name. But when they say corn, they mean barley, grain, rye, whatever. Okay? So in this weird period, of government tampering <laughs> into the economy, the license to distill is very, very easy to get. Um, so of course they proliferate. Anyone who wants to open a business does. And if you had a license to distill, here's the really big part, you'll maybe appreciate this as Americans, is you were then exempt from having 
soldiers billeted in your house. And the logic, I guess, was they assumed that if you had soldiers, you know what billeting is? It means when the government doesn't really have a barracks or places to keep soldiers, so they will put them in private homes and say, you have to house these people and feed them for this period while they're in town at your expense. So <laughs> you're paying for them. Uh, they may, you know, steal your stuff or, or look at you or, you know, go after your daughters or whatever. It's really a bad way to, to deal with soldiers. So the assumption was that we really want to encourage people to distill. So if we tell them they are exempt from billeting, people will do it. And, um, and that will cause them to go into so you know, the reason I mentioned to Americans is billeting was one of those things with uh, the tax on tea and um, and stamps that we complained about the British were doing to us so in any case the um, so there was this is called the mutiny act okay and so we they decided that if you're distilling gin you're not gonna have soldiers put in your house so what happens is by 1720 in London there are 7,000 gin shops. Anyone who really doesn't want billeting just says, I'm selling gin. Easy, easy as pie, right? Uh, by 1733, the city was distilling 11 million gallons of legal gin per year, which means 14 gallons for every man, woman, and child. Now, of course, they're not all consuming it in London. They're selling it elsewhere without the country, but that's a whole lot of gin, 14 gallons. Um, and compare that with the nine in the early 19th century U.S. or the today, um, it's 0.7 of distilled spirits okay? <laughs> per, per, per U.S. population. Um, so that's a whole lot going on. So now on the other hand, I've tried to figure out what does this actually mean in terms of the quantity. So I did a little math. If you buy one bottle of booze per week, that's 52 times a year. 0.75 liters is thir uh, times that whole year is 39 liters, or that is 10.3 gallons per year. So that's not quite the 14, but it's it's not a ridiculous quantity. It's a bottle of of uh, gin per week per, per person, including children. I guess it is a lot. Okay, I take it back. But I just wanted to put that in perspective of how much it would be. So in these years, um, what's the other side of the coin? So between 1684 and 1710, beer production fell and fell by 12%. Gin production rose by 400%. So you can see um, it is much cheaper. A dram of gin costs less than a pint of ale, equal, equal amount of alcohol. So while people swill gin, I would say, and let's come out and just, just make this clear. The first time on earth there is a real drug scare. And we're talking not just, oh, it's bad if you get drunk. Oh, there are some people who get drunk. We're talking about public measures that said, uh-oh, our whole populace is in a stupor. We need to legislate. We need to do something because they're all drunk. This is the first modern drug scare, is surprisingly gin. The first time the government actually takes notice and says, uh-oh, everyone's doing it. The first time authorities write about it, physicians, writers, artists, they become seriously concerned about widespread inebriation. And the so-called gin shops were swarming with scandalous wretches drinking as if they had no notion of a future state. Um, there they get drunk by daylight and after that run up and down the streets swearing, cursing, talking beastliness like so many devils setting ill examples and debauching our youth in general. Nay, to such a height are arrived in their wickedness that in a manner they commit lewdness in the open streets. Young girls of 12 and 13 years of age drink Geneva like fishes and make themselves unfit to live in sober families. This damned bewitching liquor makes them shameless. So it's a, not just a threat to our productivity and, and to grown people, but young girls are doing it and becoming, of course, seeping into prostitution and whatever, okay, that, that will be, you know, the downfall of the nation. So I want you to look at this, um, this print. This is by Hogarth. You might know. It's a very famous gin lane um, of 1751. And I've actually got a big, big print of this because I want you to look closely at what's going on in this. Um, 
you can see that there's a woman covered in scars and so forth who's got a dropping her baby off of the uh, the uh, staircase there you can see that there's various uh, people drinking gin and going blind and uh, which may really have happened of course there's no laws about what you put in your gin and then in the background there's people being on various states of unlawfulness being hung see there's a, a gallows somewhere in the distance there's coffins being raised up and down there's general tumult everywhere uh, people in the uh, pawn shop pawning all their goods so they can buy gin and basically toothless um, sc scrofulous diseased wretched miserable, horrid <laughs> nastiness. Well, well, so the Hogarth obviously was against gin. The other side of the picture is, is actually a little more confusing. It shows Beer Lane, which is, shows people healthy and happy and drinking beer, and, and of course that's the virtuous drink, but I've always thought there's something else going on here, because the people on the other side are actually kind of really fat. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know whether this was all, you know, good-looking in, in uh, his time. I'm not sure it was, because they're, they're really big. And, um, and I've always wondered whether the, the you know, beer street scene really would have been so appealing in contrast to this horrible debauchery. Um, and so it kind of, I, I, I think maybe what it's doing is it's not just making fun of the poor and you know, their, their predilection for gin, but I think it's also making fun of the middle class and their kind of smugness of, of thinking, oh, we drink beer, so we're more, uh, we're, we're not you know, addicted to this gin stuff. And, and maybe implying that they're actually responsible for the poverty that's on the other side because beer is, costs more money now and it's, you, have to have, you have to be wealthier to, to afford beer. So, so I'm not sure it's quite so you know, black and white as it, as it makes out to be, as, pe as it seems that the gin is the corrupt side and the beer lane is the beer street is the, uh, is the virtuous. I don't know about that. So, but in any case, why do I say this is an enormous scare, apart from these, you know, illustrations and things? There are a couple of infamous cases um, that come to popular attention, and, and something I should mention here that um, is not directly related to alcohol, but it is actually to the whole field of communication, is that newspapers exist. You know, you can get broad, broadside, you know, posters, basically. You can print large-scale um, uh, advertisements begin, really, here but also is, is the newspapers with public opinion, um, restaurant reviews, things like ads, yeah, actually appear right here. So in any case, this case of this person named Judith Dufour, who put her two-year-old child, Mary, into a workhouse because she couldn't feed her. And I don't know what a two-year-old's gonna be able to do, but in any case, she couldn't feed her. She gives, gives her baby to this workhouse. And when she found out they'd given the baby a new set of clothes, she took the baby back strangled it and sold the clothes to buy more gin okay so uh now again who knows if this is true the accusations who knows but it was a really popular story in the papers and what she said in her confession is that she did do this with a gypsy woman named suki no no notice gypsies are always disreputable in every account and this is this is the testimony she gave which was of course reported in the papers on Sunday night, we took the child into the fields and stripped it and tied a linen handkerchief hard around its neck to keep it, keep it from crying, laid it in a ditch. After that, we went together, sold the coat for a shilling and the petticoat and stockings for a groat. We parted the money, we split it meaning, and, and joins for a quartern of gin, meaning they bought a quart of gin with the uh, money that they had from the clothes. Now again, who knows if this is true, but it caused a public uproar. Um, and, and there were other similar cases um, that looked kind of like the, you know, the lady in the painting <laughs> dropping her baby. So uh, Mary Eastwick at one point came home quite intoxicated with gin, sat down before the fire, and it is supposed had the child in her lap, which fell out of it into the hearth and the fire catched hold of the child's clothes and it burnt to death. And apparently she never noticed because she was dead drunk and fell asleep and the baby was there and it rolled off into the, into the fire. So another, um, you know, not celebrated in a positive way, but, but a, people were horrified by this, that, that drunkenness and gin could cause um, murder. So 
there was also an, uh, an economic argument against drink, uh, drinking gin that the drinkers actually made bad consumers. Uh, in 1736, Thomas Wilson, in uh, a book called Distilled Spirits, The Bane of the Nation, argued that when people spend their money on gin, they actually eat less, they pawn their clothes instead of buying new ones, and they never really have enough money to buy all the goods that we're manufacturing. So they're actually damaging the rest of society. It's not just their own health, and it's not just, you know, the, the criminal acts or destitution that they may be led to and then turning onto the public, you know, um, charity for help, but they're actually causing the consumption of the nation to go down and, and harming everyone in turn because they're, they're just buying gin. Now he's not saying, of course he's leaving out the fact that the distillers are making money, but in any case, the problem becomes so bad that the government issues what's called the Gin Act in 1736 that finally puts a tax on gin. It has a minimum quantity that can be sold. Now that sounds really weird, but it means that you can't buy a small amount. You have to buy a large amount, two gallons. So you can't just spend you know, a penny and get drunk on this. Um, and that to run a shop to own a license, well, you'll have to pay 50 pounds. So it's a lot of, that's a lot of money. That's like $5,000 or, you know, 50,000, whatever it is. It's a lot of money in those days. And shops, what happened it, um, is that the people whose whole livelihood for a generation had been based on gin suddenly open what are the equivalents of speakeasies. And of course, this is a rule that will go down through history, down to the present, is if you make something illegal, the sale of it will go underground, right? You think we, in this country, might have learned something about prohibition from <laughs> from taxes like this, but we didn't. Um, so speakeasies start popping up. My favorite of these is owned by Captain Dudley Bradstreet under the sign of, of a tomcat. It's called Old Toms. And what you do is you go up to the little window, you move the, the slide there, and you whisper, Puss? <laughs> <laughs> Pussycat, are you there? And the response is meow. And then <laughs> you can buy gin. And it means that you are not police. Um, and they will pass you gin very surreptitiously, I guess. And you hand over the money. So this people get really good at this, they, uh, at selling. And remember, there's not a major police force. So, so there's n really, really hard for them to track down who's selling it and where it's coming from. And eventually the government said, well, let's reward informers. So anyone who, who tells on these secret um, gin shops would um, be rewarded. And so if the mobs found an informer, they would attack that person and, you know, and kill them or, you know, tar and feather them or whatever. So, so in any case, the laws don't work is the, is the point, such that eventually they, um, they say, okay, let's lower the taxes because this is not working. And then finally, by 1743, which is, you know, just, it's um, six, four, five, six, seven years later, they abolish the tax again, because they, they cannot get away with it, um, um, with tax, because no one pays the taxes. So the, um, <clears throat> Henry Fielding, great, really delightful writer, um, wrote this inquiry into the causes of the late increase in robbery. Okay, now there's crime rampant everywhere, says this. The principal sustenance, if it may so be called, of more than a hundred thousand people in this metropolis, many of these wretches there are who swallow pints of this poison within the 24 hours, the dreadful effects of which I have the misfortune to see every day and smell too. Keep in mind, there are also um, no laws against adulteration, as I said, so you could add turpentine, alum, anything to take away the nasty flavor you, you could just throw in. Um, and this whole period kind of gets obsessed with highway robbery, <laughs> with, with, you know, uh, people hitting stagecoaches. That's really what they are, okay? You think you, we associate that with the West, but this whole idea of people robbing travelers. Um, or think of, think of this, uh, there's a great, uh, John Gay wrote this thing called The Beggar's Opera. You might be familiar with it because it's the play that's the basis for the Three Penny Opera, which is, um, but the Beggar's Opera is soaked in gin, crime, prostitution, um, destitution, and uh, the, the play, the, the musical by Brecht and Weil is based on that. 
um, which maybe we'll play, I'll play you some, because even though the Three Penny Opera takes place in the 19th century, um, the in London, the original is the 18th century, so just so you know that there's this, they, they changed the, the setting. But it's in this context, I want to be also clear, that John Wesley begun to preach to crowds. You all know who John Wesley is, right? The founder of the religion of Methodism. Um, started preaching to great crowds in what's called the, this whole religious revival called the Great Awakening. Um, and eventually, I shouldn't say separate religion, it's Christianity, but it's a sect called Methodism, um, which has a very, very strong teetotaling streak in it. Um, now this should seem really weird to you. Wait, 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 Christianity that doesn't drink? Absolutely, this is the first time. And the reason is because of this gin craze. Um, and in fact, when Wesley was sent to Georgia to help run a colony, which we, well, we call it Georgia now, named after the king, George, right? Um, there wasn't going to be alcohol there. That was the whole point. So, um, you know, so again, medicinal drinking is another thing, but for pleasure to get drunk, suddenly this is considered a really nasty sin. And I think the only reason the gin craze finally abated was another gin act that raised the excises. This time they said, we have a war, we have to pay for it, um, and we, we can't whatever it is, we need to raise money however we can. Um, and the other thing that sort of happens after mid-century is there's a real serious drop in real wages among the poor. So there wasn't, they didn't actually have any money, extra money to spend on cheap drink. Um, then there's crop failures and a, um, um, led, led to a ban on use of domestic grains for distillation because there was literally no bread at a point. So it's not as if the industry kind of shrank. Strangely enough, it actually just the opposite happens. Um, what, ha what happened globally um, is really capitalism, right? That comes in at the end of the 18th century, thanks to our, uh, the hero of capitalism is uh, Adam Smith. The, um, but in good capitalist mode, the, the distillers just said, well, let's just sell it elsewhere. Let, let's find new markets. Let's target new consumers. Let's refurbish, listen to this closely, refurbish the image of gin by giving it a makeover, by making it a sophisticated drink for the wealthy, for global trendsetters, for people who want to imitate the refined English. So in very real sense, think of the timing here, gin becomes the drink of choice throughout the empire. Remember the British Empire now um, stretches sun, the sun never sets on the British Empire. There's a reason they say that, is it's global now. Um, and, and gin becomes a symbol of Britishness, okay? And I want you to think about the brands of gin that, that appear in this era. Um, Gordon's dates to 1769, one of the first to reach this global market. Um, and in many cases, oh, another thing to mention is that these new colonies were often in hot climates. So the last thing you really wanna drink when it's really hot is a brown liquor, right? You don't wanna drink scotch. You don't wanna drink brandy or, or anything like that is you want something that's bracing and astringent and thirst quenching and has a, even a quasi medicinal kind of association with it. So gin is the perfect drink for hot weather, right? You don't drink gin in winter, do you? Um, so it's, uh, and the idea also in the colonies was that you could take that gin and make it more palatable by mixing it with other things. Citrus, which was gonna stave off your scurvy or more important, something that I should introduce here is called tonic water. Now, what is tonic? Okay, there have been tonics. They tone your body, make you, your muscles, if you're feeling lax and weak, you're, this will tone you up and make you, um, invigorate you. But they contain a substance to this day, in fact, called quinine, which gives it a bitter flavor, really quenches your thirst, but quinine is a remedy against malaria. A real one. I mean, I mean that we still use it for that <laughs> today. We still believe that quinine does that. So I want you to think of, you know, foremost of the Raj, the British ex expatriates in India who have been stationed there. What do they want to drink? British gin. Uh, the Middle East throughout British colonies there. By the 19th century, colonies in sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, you know, uh, most of Africa actually is, it becomes uh, col colonies of the. Uh, of the English, and later on, of course, Australia, um, New Zealand, Canada remains a British colony. So it's, so it's around the world, uh, gin becomes a, 
a thing associated reminding you of your Britishness, even if you're in some far-flung colony. And I would say, even back in England, the country, by the time we get to the 19th century, had changed dramatically. Let me, let me talk about these things, because they're, they're all connected to many of the lectures we'll be talking about in the coming weeks. There was a dramatic population growth. The cities expanded um, exponentially. And areas that had been rural just a generation before are now industrial booming centers. The Industrial Revolution hit. Okay? So places like Leeds, Sheffield, Manchester pop up as big thriving cities out of nowhere, literally, in Midlands and Northern England. Um, and I think the most important changes that happen are really technological. So think of Watt's steam engine, think of the develop of coal-burning locomotives that could transport goods anywhere inland much, much quicker, and you don't have to be on a river anymore, right? And most importantly, the development of the first truly industrial, modern, when I say industrial, machine-driven factories, making, of course, gin. And the names we've been familiar with are all there, right in this era. So Alexander Gordon we've seen. There's also Felix Booth, which is another, another brand of gin you can find around. Charles Tanqueray in 1830, that's when that's founded. Tanqueray is still a great gin. James Burroughs, who founds Beefeater in 1863. And Walter and Alfred Gilby. Gilby is another brand of gin. It's actually cheap <laughs> junk nowadays, but that's a real set of people. Um, and they're the ones who really remade gin's image from cheap rot cut sold in the street to something fairly well made, um, fairly expensive, it's not a cheap drink anymore, and that uses quality ingredients. And in other words, what it took really to change the image of gin was corporations with money, with capital sitting around, and most importantly, with the money to advertise. Advertising changes the whole ball game. Everything is different now, is that you can not just play on the associations people may have with an alcohol, but you can actually change its image yourself with um, advertising, with copy, with images, with whatever. Um, and they, these companies, make gin a worldly sophisticated product. Um, again, the, the other, the reason they're able to do this on an industrial scale is the new coffee still. Remember that big column still we talked about? Um, just as the Scots are using it in Scotland, used for gin in England. And um, I should mention also that this new still is actually, Coffee didn't invent it. He stole the idea from a guy named Robert Stein in 1827, <laughs> but it's very similar. Um, Coffee's the one who got the patent. So, um, but the point, and point of the advantage of this is you never have to stop production. It produces a much ref more refined spirit that has a higher alcohol and is clear, okay, perfectly clear. And thus the flavor of the botanicals come through much more cleanly also. You don't, you don't have a green spirit with the you know, color of the, the whatever you've thrown in there. Um, so the style of gin increasingly that they made, which is really good for mixing, is called London Dry, meaning it doesn't have sugar in it, it um, and uh, that you had to put sugar in the earlier gin, which is much cruder. Okay? And by the mid-century, um, English gin was being sent all around the world in a new mode of transport, steamships, right? So it's, it's, it's the drink, whether you're in Canada or Australia or Sudan, um, it's what you would drink. So a new kind of establishment also popped up, which is called the Gin Palace. It's sort of a brightly lit bar. People who are respectable will go in there. Men and women can order drink at a seat. And it's something sort of like a saloon in the 19th century, if you want to think about it. The waitresses are fancily dressed, there's velvet curtains and a nice looking wooden bar. Um, that adds to the allure of gin because there they also mix it. They make cocktails, they, but it has these sort of exotic associations. Um, you can serve it at parties, it's not, you know, it's something. So cocktails, of course, are an American invention, but um, the idea of taking what was originally a punch bowl, right, having a big mixed drink in there and everyone serving themselves, to having an individually made drink in your glass, a whole mixing there, that's an American invention. Um, and gin, of course, becomes one of the major mixers, okay? Uh, you can have whatever you like. Um, and I think this is, this is why cocktails take over from the punch bowl mid-century, because if you go into a bar, you want that drink made freshly. You don't want the ice melted, you don't want it sitting around. So you want it shaken or stirred or whatever and served right to you then and there. Um, and the way that cocktails come about is through the brand advertising, putting a name on a spirit. So if you go into a bar, you'll say, I want Gordon's or I want Booth's or I want whatever it may be. Um, and of course, if you 
invite people over to your house, you have the bottle there. You show them the label, which is on this, very clearly marked, so they will say, ooh, you bought that brand. That must mean you're smart and sophisticated. Um, so it's a mark of status. Remember, bottles now carry brand labeling, which is something really new. Um, so these gin palaces, and I'll, I'll show you some images in class, are the places where middling sorts of people would go or if you were wealthy, you would, of course, have a cocktail party uh, at home or go to the club and order a cocktail. Um, private clubs, of course, you know, would carry the most expensive gin because you, you pay a lot to be a member there. Um, and that is really a fascinating phenomenon socially. You know, a club is, of course, a place where only men go, a place where you can drink, and you're probably going to run into someone you know there, right? But you don't have to sit down at one table, order a meal in a formal restaurant. Restaurants date to about this era also. Um, but they've become, interestingly, places where people will go to make business deals, talk politics. Um, but notice that they are private. You can't just walk in off the street. You know, the rabble is, isn't even allowed in. So this is so sort of for the upper class British who increasingly their business and politics, of course, takes place in London. This is places they hang out where um, they will go to have a, um, you know, a cocktail and talk to other people. And, and in fact, many of these clubs have their own signature drinks. They invent cocktails there. And we'll see that the, 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 the golden age of cocktails um, will be the late 19th century and then into the early 20th. Um, especially in the United States, but the, um, you know, these places, um, well, let, let me just talk a little bit about gin in the present, because this is, well, you know, I like to sort of compare what's happening past and now. We're go undergoing a period where gin is also being given a makeover because the major brands like Gordon's and Gilby's are really not so great anymore, right? So gin, I think, was really one of the first to, to jump on this craft bandwagon, the idea that gin was made special and by artists, and um, this happens in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years. Artisanal handcrafted gins made in small batches, really interesting botanicals that funnily look like the late medieval, early modern versions, strangely enough. Um, juniper, of course, you have to have, but now they're starting to throw in coriander or orange peel, fennel, cardamom, cubebs go in, and that's a totally medieval spice. That's something that you would not have seen since really the, the Renaissance era. Um, and some of these, um, well, let me mention a couple of names because they're, they're, they kind of, they're still around and they're the ones who started this craze for, um, for craft gin. Bombay Sapphire, I think, was one that really started much of this. That was launched in 1987, not by a small producer, actually by Bacardi. And they came out with an old recipe for gin that had juniper, lemon peel, grains of paradise. Remember that medieval spice from Africa? Um, coriander, cubeb, orris root, bitter almonds, cassia, licorice, and angelica. Really kind of amazing. And of course, think of what they put on the label. They put Queen Victoria on the label. And, you know, the association of Bombay is with the, not Mumbai, the modern name of the city, but Bombay is with, of course, the, um, with the British rule in India, of the empire. Um, it's a dry gin, but it tastes so different than others. It's very floral. Um, there's, of course, nothing artisanal about it, but this is the way they wanted people to think, is that gin could be even more expensive and crafted in some way. Now, the one that's really the, the kicker in craft gin is Hendrix. It's also now a huge company based in Scotland, launched in 2000. What makes it really unique is it's not London dry gin. It's very different. It's a little sweet, in fact, and it has rose petals, cucumber and chamomile in it. And I think it opened people's minds up to, wow, gin doesn't have to be this dry, dry, dry bracing thing that you want to hide the flavor with tonic water or something or lemon. Um, and then, you know, other gin, and we're talking the past decade, Leopold's in Colorado um, has cardamom, coriander, Valencia oranges, pomelo. Nearby here, there's aviation gin, which includes lavender, sarsaparilla, aniseed. So, and, and in fact, if you were to walk down the gin aisle in, in your, your local liquor store, you'll find there are dozens of new brands and new, new ones keep popping up every day. And some of them are really, really interesting. And they're not, they're not your grandfather's old London dried beef eater gin. They're, they're actually kind of interesting. So we'll pick it up with, uh, I don't know what we're doing next time, another alcohol. Okay. See you then.